But to start off this afternoon, I want to call up here onto the stage Professor Dr. Christian Bauchhage. He's going to start our afternoon session. Where is he here? Oh, come over here. I couldn't find you. Give him a round of applause, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah, great. Welcome back, everybody. I, have, I hope you had a great lunch. So um, let's kick this session off with the question, artificial intelligence, where are we and where are we heading? Um, as you can see, I am affiliated with the University of Bonn and Fraunhofer IAIS. And whenever I give a presentation, I typically have to begin with a bit of propaganda as to what Fraunhofer is and Fraunhofer does. But here at SEBIT, this is not necessary. Just go and visit the Fraunhofer booth in Hall 6. It's all about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Let me begin by the following quote. The greatest shortcoming of the human race is our inability to understand the exponential function. That is by Bartlett, he is an American physicist. What could that possibly mean? Here we see a timeline of human civilization. Interestingly, it starts at about 9000 BC in Göbekli Tepe in southeastern Turkey. There are huge temple mounds that had just been discovered in the 1990s. And the existence of uh, these uh, stone masonry work pushes back the history of mankind by 6,000 years. But here you see it starting about 9000 BC, and then we see ancient Sumer, we see the pyramids of Egypt, the ancient Greeks, and then the 20th century. So this is the history of humankind, and this is the development of the world gross product over the history of humankind. And this is exponential growth. And it looks really crazy, but this curve would look the same if I had chosen any other period in this long period. The nature of exponential growth is that at the very end, things are so dramatically fast that they outgrow everything that has happened up until then. What has happened in the 20th century? Look at this. All of these are technologies that were invented in the 20th century, and we could not imagine our daily lives or our professional lives without them anymore. None of these things existed 110 years ago. And keeping this in mind, let's now move on to artificial intelligence. Indeed, we are living in very exciting times. What has happened in the last couple of years is nothing short but miraculous. And there are three major technological trends that now have come together and have led to the incredible advancements we have seen recently. And these three trends are the availability of big data, affordable high-performance computing, and so-called deep learning systems. Bringing them all together has led to progress in artificial intelligence. And from now on, you might uh, hear me mentioning the term neural networks quite a lot. So I'm not sure as to whether or not I'm preaching to the choir here, but I thought it might be a good idea to ever so briefly, ever so briefly, remind all of us about what an artificial neural network is. On the left-hand side, you see a sketch. It's a graphical representation of a mathematical neuron. A mathematical neuron is a function that takes some input, numbers. Everything can be cast in terms of numbers, whether it's an image or a speech signal or your accounting statement. Everything that is present in the memory of a computer can be understood as a collection of numbers. So such an artificial mathematical neuron takes in a number of numbers. I have called them x1 and so on. 
And these numbers are weighted by so-called weights. It's just the multiplication. And then they are being added, and an output is generated. And I'm grossly oversimplifying things here, but think of such a computational unit as answering a yes-no question. Yes, no. That is basically the output given some input. And if you collect many of these neurons into an architecture, as seen on the right, we call that a neural network. And here the heading is, it's a deep neural network. Well, it's called deep because it consists of several layers of neurons. But again, this is a gross understatement because nowadays we are talking about artificial neural networks with dozens, up to hundreds of layers of neurons and millions upon millions of neurons. But this is an artificial neural network, a sketch of it. And really, just think of each of these computational units answering yes-no questions or making yes-no decisions. And how can such a system learn? Well, the typical idea is you present an input to such a network, and you also present the network with the output you want it to gener generate. And so it sees the input and the target output. And if you have millions of pairs of input and desired output, this computational architecture can adjust the weights I've been talking about, such that, on average, it produces the desired output. This is what we call learning, adjusting the weights in such an architecture. What has happened? Why? Is everybody so excited about deep learning recently? Where is the revolution? What's going on? Well, we have seen for the last five to six years dramatic progress in the area of cognitive computing. And when I'm mentioning the term cognition, well, then it sounds as if that would have to be something that has to do with the human brain or that is exclusive to the human brain. But this ain't so anymore. We have seen breakthroughs in the area of automatic text analysis and understanding. We have seen breakthroughs in the area of automatic image understanding, speech recognition, and robotics. If you don't believe me, just go to Hall 12, have a look at the robots. What you can see here is an example as to what is possible with neural networks these days. There is a sentence, and that sentence reads, this film doesn't care about cleverness, wit, or any other kind of intelligent humor. This is a critique about a movie. And it's, of course, a devastating critique, because this film doesn't care about cleverness, humor, and so on. Interestingly enough, most of the words in this sentence have a rather positive connotation. Cleverness is a good thing. Wit is a good thing. Intelligent is a good thing. Humor is a doubly good thing. It has two pluses here. What we see here is what we call a pass tree. This sentence was presented to a neural network, and this neural network has then analyzed the grammatical structure of this tree uh, sentence. It, had, it has recognized what is the noun here, what is the verb, what is the object, what is the grammatical structure. And not only did it recognize the grammatical structure, but it also recognized the sentiment expressed in all these parts of the sentence. And whenever a node in this tree representation of the sentence is colored in blue, then the network thinks that the corresponding part of the sentence is something positive. And as you can see, the topmost node in this past tree is red. So this artificial neural network has understood that this is a negative sentence. And just from counting the occurrence of positive or negative terms, something we did until a couple of years ago, you would never have been able to figure this out. Neural networks nowadays can understand text. We have seen paradigmatic shifts in many areas of science and business. The finance industry, finance and insurance, financial services, they are in a frenzy right now. They're investing billions upon billions of dollars and euros into artificial intelligence for, among others, trading. There are indeed hedge funds that have 
replaced all their human analysts and all their human decision makers by artificial intelligence software by now. So money, to a large extent, is now traded by machines. And these machines have learned the trading patterns of other machines, but this is where we are at right now. There are breakthroughs in the area of uh, medical diagnostics. What you can see in the lower left is an example uh, from the area of oncology. These are uh, mammographic pictures. Uh, the problem here was to detect breast cancer. And a neural network has been trained with hundreds upon thousands of images like that and has been trained to detect the existence of cancerous tissue. And I brought you this example because it is particularly interesting. After having seen many upon many upon many training images, what this neural network has learned is that it is not important to actually look for the tumor itself, but there's a strong indicator, some other uh, modifications of the tissue, not in the immediate vicinity of the tumor cells, but somewhere else nearby, which is a strong indicator as to there has to be a tumor somewhere. And this is new knowledge to humankind. Up until 2013, medical doctors didn't know this. This is a piece of intelligence, this is a piece of knowledge that was gifted humankind by trained artificial neural networks. Now, this is textbook material, but five years ago, humankind did not know that we do not have to search for the tiny tumor itself. If there are some uh, modifications of the tissue anyway, then there must be a tumor. We now know this. This is how it looks like when you are the best in the world at what you do and the machine beats you anyway. We've seen it this morning already in Toby Walsh's talk. On the left, Kasparov beaten in chess in 1997 by IBM Deep Blue. Then IBM again in 2011. Watson, live on television, did win the game show Jeopardy. These are Jenning and Rutters, uh, who were up until then the best participants in this game show. And yes, last year, Lee Sedol lost against Google AlphaGo, and that was a feat that most computer scientists on the planet thought impossible. And that includes myself. One of my lectures at the University of Bonn is called Game AI. In that lecture, I teach the students how, you know, computers play games. And we learned how they play chess. And then I told them two years ago, last time I gave that class, well, now we know how to program a computer to play chess, and this is good and well, but this will never work for Go. And I said two years ago, in my lifetime, I will never see a machine beating the world champion in Go. How could I have been so sure? Well, first of all, I was wrong, right? Not even two years later, it happened. But consider this. There are 10 raised to the power of 170 possible developments a game of Go can take, courses a game of Go can take. And this is such a brutally large number, I have to break it down for you. The number of atoms in the universe is estimated to be 10 to the 80th. If for each of the atoms in the universe, there was another universe, and we would count all the atoms in these 10 to the 80 universes, we would have 10 to the 160 atoms, which is much, much less than 10 to the 170 possible courses a game of Go can take. This was thought to be impossible, and what they did here, they used neural networks, and these neural networks, after lengthy training time, developed an intuition as to how to play Go. Crazily enough, it does not even have to be neural networks. This is something that was reported last year that did not get the amount of attention it would have merited. The University of Cincinnati developed an artificial intelligence system 
that is used by the Department of Defense in the US in battlefield simulations, in particular in flight simulations. And the scenario there is, uh, there is an attack on the mainland US, and this AI system is supposed to assume the role of the defenders. And this AI system is not based on neural networks. It uses a technique that is called fuzzy logic together with genetic programming, something totally different. Uh, it is a deep system, though. So there are many, many, many decisions made at any point in time. This AI system, to this date, has not been beaten by the best fighter pilots the US have. They've thrown everything at it, no human up until today has ever beaten this system. This system is implemented on a Raspberry Pi. That is a computer for 35 euros, originally intended to teach kids in school how to program. Now, all of this has tremendous implications for lots of areas of business, right? You might be tempted to say, well, it doesn't affect me. My job is more or less on the creative side of things. Think again. What we see here is C code that was generated by a neural network. Uh, this neural network is actually a so-called recurrent neural network. It's a neural network that has memory. And it had been fed the Linux kernel source code, so thousands upon thousands of lines of C code. And it has learned how C code looks like. And now you can run it in reverse, and it generates C code. Um, those of you who are programmers will recognize this as rubbish. This does nothing, but it does not crash. Right? This is syntactically correct C code. And it's just a matter of time now until these neural networks do indeed produce useful C code. In particular, if you train them to do so. This has not been trained to do so. It just reproduces this. So things are looking bleak for computer scientists like me as well. But it gets worse. This is computer-generated art. Uh, what we see on the left-hand side in the upper row is an example of what is called neural network tomography. A picture had been presented to a neural network that had learned to recognize the content of images. In this image, apparently, it was two gazelles grazing somewhere in the grassland of Africa. And you can look into the activities of such a neural network and what it computes, and you can say, OK, so this neuron seems to be particularly active whenever the input looks like this. So how could we make it even more active? How would the input image have to look like so as to encourage the neuron to be really convinced that this is a job for this particular neuron? Well, this is the answer. If the image were to look like this, so this has been reverse engineered, the neuron would be perfectly happy uh, with uh, generating an answer such as two gazelles grazing in the steppe of Africa. This is called Google Deep Dream. Check it out on the internet. Amazing pictures humankind has never seen before. What we see on the upper right is computer-generated art. We have the Venus of Milo and the painting by Miro. And a neural network has been trained to take the content of one image and to render it in the style of another one. And what has happened here is it has rendered the Venus of Milo using the graphical style of Miro. This is computer-generated art. This neural network did not do this on its own. It did not wake up with the idea, oh, let me generate a picture today. It is still people who use the AI to do something like this. But this is what AI can do these days. And in the lower row is an example of computer-generated music. And here's another story. When I was still a student, one of my friends was uh, a musician. And he made a very good living out of composing what is called elevator music, you know, musical or sound garbage. But this was a profession up until, I would say, today that uh, was paid very well. Of course, like, you know, for a musician, it's a bit of an embarrassment to be one of the guys who do the elevator sound, but pays very well. Nowadays, 
You know, you feed lots of um, music into a neural network and train it to learn the structure of uh, what makes music. And you can have musical style transfer. You can listen on the internet to Beethoven's Ode to Joy played in the style of Bossa Nova. All this is possible these days. But in particular, uh, neural networks can now generate music. Check it out on the internet. It's there. It's a reality. And they can generate music as a speed that so totally exceeds what a human composer could do. And they do it at a price that so totally undercuts the price of a human composer. One of the jobs that are superfluous right now is actually the job of a composer of elevator music. Uh, at Fraunhofer, we also work with these neural networks, and these are just a couple of examples as to where we use them. Our job is to help industry to transfer the latest research results into industrial practice, into everyday working environments. And things are really getting crazier by the day. In December 2015, Google publicly released the so-called TensorFlow library that is the software Google uses on, and has developed in-house for all their AI systems. And now it's open source. You can download it. You can install it on your computer. You can use it to train your own neural networks. Your kids can do it. Everybody can do it. It still helps if you know what you're doing, but it's not really necessary. Now, they have released this, and the question is, of course, why would they do this? Given that there is such a bright future for AI, why would Google give away this powerful piece of software for free? I know exactly why, and this is because 10 years ago, um, I was way more stupid. Uh, 10 years ago, I was still a researcher at Deutsche Telekom, and that was back at the time when Google did release the Android operating system for smartphones, and my managers wanted to know why did they do it, do some research, figure that out. I couldn't, because I thought, well, Google is a search engine. Why would they ever be interested in smartphones? Even if they were interested in smartphones, why would they ever be interested in operating systems for smartphones? And third of all, even if they were interested in operating systems for smartphones, why would they make them open source? Ten years later, 80% of all the smartphones in the world run on Android. This is what they're trying to do right now. In 10 years from now, the idea is that at least 80% of all the AI will run on Google TensorFlow. However, others have smartened up in the meantime as well. Not four weeks later, Microsoft, a company that is known for their open source philosophy, open-sourced the computational network toolkit. And yet another week later, Facebook open-sourced their neural network libraries. And the future is already knocking at our doors. These are quantum computers produced by a company that's called D-Wave. I don't know where they are, but they are at Savit. You can talk to them. These have been presented in the fall of 2015 to the public in a press conference, working quantum computers. And this is the cover of The Economist from last week. And as you can see, the title or the topic of the technology quarterly is quantum computing. A mind-bending technology goes mainstream. Why would that be noteworthy? Well, get this. Two years ago, end of 2014, beginning of 2015, the cover of The Economist was all about machine learning. And now it's two years later, and I'm talking to you. So let's extrapolate this. The next big thing is already there. And there are players who have already seen this or recognized this. Um, Google has a website that is called Quantum Playground. You can go there and play around with quantum computing algorithms. And IBM has something that is called the Quantum Experience. It's a cloud-based service. You can upload quantum computing programs there. 
and then they will compile them and either simulate them on a classical computer, or if you pay them, they'll actually run it on a quantum computer. So the future is already there. Uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning depends to a large extent on things that we call optimization and search, and this is something quantum computers can do very, very fast, so things will continue to accelerate. And of course, all of this will have tremendous impact on our daily lives and on our um, professional lives. And I'll just skip this. I have a couple of things about Industry 4.0. So this really is happening right now. This is not science fiction anymore. Please take this away. This future is going on right now, and it's not just three years down the road. Uh, if you are in a company that hasn't figured out their AI strategy yet, it is high time you do something about this. Here are a couple of crazy statements to wrap all of this up. McKinsey predicts that by 2027, in 10 years from now, 75% of all the standard and poor 500 companies will have disappeared. No 75% of all the standard and poor 500 companies are the ones who do not have an AI strategy. McKinsey predicts that 60% of all professions will be affected by automation. And I predict, you know, after this debacle, debacle with uh, Go, I had to change my mind. So my newest stance is, in 10 years from now, everything that is a process, and think about, you know, composing mu music is a process. Uh, doing an accountant sheet is a process. Planning a logistic chain is a process. Everything that is a process will be done by an AI in 10 years from now. And here is a prediction I made um, in 2016. The largest artificial neural network on the planet had 160 billion synapses. And that is more than you'd find in the brain of a bee. Bees are intelligent, they find honey, they can communicate that. If we double this every year, it'll take until 2029, until we have artificial neural networks that have the same power than the human brain. Thank you. Okay. Did, did, did you want... Did you I, would I, I, any questions? We maybe have time for one question. If not, we... All right, here we go, right here. Hi, a very nice presentation. Um, do you think quantum calculation will, will anyway lead to continuation of this trend, or will it be a, a, a step or a if different this, ramp? If this quantum stuff happens, which I believe it will, because if it's on the cover of The Economist, then they are very good at predicting these kind of things, <laughs> uh, then there will be another leap, like, like the kind of leap we have seen five years ago, um, which kick-started all of this. Yeah, there will be another jump. If The Economist says it's so, it's so. Pardon? If The Economist says it's so, then it's so. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay. Any more? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.